Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Arundel House for the launch of the 2017 edition of Strategic Survey, our annual assessment of geopolitics covering the year to mid-2017. Uh, I'm joined by four colleagues here on stage, Emil Hokayam, Nigel Inkster, Virginia Comley, and Nick Redman, who will be uh, ready to answer your questions at the end of this statement and will, in fact, make a couple of remarks of their own uh, following mine, just to uh, add a little bit more uh, detail. But to begin, um, I will outline our principal conclusions and some of the highlights from this, the 51st edition uh, of IISS Strategic Survey. The year to mid-2017 witnessed a dramatic fracturing of alliances and strategic relationships internationally that previously had been held to be safely solid. Much of the damage was self-inflicted. Substantial efforts will be required in 2018 and beyond to repair these alliances and partnerships. The NATO alliance was buffeted by repeated warnings from the incoming US administration that its support would be moderated unless rapid, real increases were made in European defense expenditure. The unease was compounded by the prospect of the US cutting a grand bargain with Russia over the heads of its allies. Turkey's authoritarian drift and its allies' reaction to it placed a further strain on NATO. In the Pacific region, too, US allies had reason to doubt the durability of the US commitment as Washington's withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement left a gaping hole in its Asian strategy that is yet to be filled. While the United States remained resolute in the face of North Korea's provocations, not all of its allies initially held so firm. South Korea's new president, Moon Jae-in, chose to freeze and later only temporarily resume the US deployment of the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Missile System meant to protect South Korea and US troops serving there from North Korea's shorter range missiles. That said, Pyongyang's serial provocations did in time lead Seoul to adopt a much more robust stance. Institutions suffered too. The EU27 maintained unity over the UK's prospective exit, but intramural tensions with Poland and Hungary sorely tested the bloc's values. The EU's internal preoccupations had the effect of releasing destabilizing dynamics in the Western Balkans that allied with Russian meddling and organized crime put Europe's southeastern neighborhood at heightened risk. In the Middle East, the one regional institution that had appeared to be at least reasonably stable, the Gulf Cooperation Council, began to tear itself apart as Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain sought to coerce Qatar to cease financing terrorists and interfering in their internal affairs by closing borders and cutting ties. The strident nature of the public diplomacy on both sides left the impression that damage to the integrity of the GCC could well be permanent. The fracture of these various partnerships and alliances opened fresh opportunities for states dissatisfied with the status quo to reap gains and widen the fissures. Compared to the defenders of the status quo, the challenger states exhibited a superior ability to devise and implement strategies to achieve their more limited goals. We are living through a moment in which domestic concerns are tying down the democracies to a greater extent than their authoritarian rivals. In Europe, Russia has taken advantage of the EU's internal preoccupations and partial US disengagement to probe for weaknesses in the Western Balkans, which, having been largely bypassed in the expansion of the EU and NATO, is Europe's soft underbelly. In parts of the subregion, Moscow has been rebuffed, but that has done little to blunt its appetite. Russia is using the full sweep of state power and capacities to create dependencies, cultivate clients, and undermine rivals. Intelligence professionals and others point to a witch's brew of cyber activity, information warfare, support for political movements, and tacit promotion of various types of illegal activity. This disruptive engagement runs alongside more classical security challenges that Russia, dissatisfied with the current security system in Europe, is posing. 
military developments and deployments, including ones that probably breached the 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, are overt and threaten Europe's balance of power. These military challenges will force NATO continually to develop more robust policies of deterrence and defense. In the Middle East, Russia and another challenger power, Iran, have exploited America's detachment to consolidate their dominance of the Syrian battlefield and strengthen their client, President Bashar al-Assad. Russia has consolidated its military presence in the country and become the dominant force seeking to broker a settlement between Assad and his opponents in Syria. More disturbing for the regional balance of power, however, is the way in which Iran has used the Syrian conflict to extend its reach into the Levant. Through its support of various Shia transnational militias in the south of Syria, and given its other proxy relationships, Iran has effectively established political influence and territorial contiguity through Iraq and Syria to Lebanon. This was the context in which the GCC's Qatar crisis erupted, an organization established in large measure to stand up to Iran appeared willing to lose one of its members that had been suspected in Terelia of being too close to Tehran. Texit, the prospect of Qatar leaving the GCC, has not yet perhaps become an accepted neologism, but it was openly being discussed. The UAE in particular has argued vociferously for a new set of relations in the Gulf. Saudi Arabia may yet come round to the view that fracturing an organization which should be a force multiplier for Riyadh is not strategically smart. It will insist at a minimum on Qatar moderating its support for extremist movements and the editorial line of Al Jazeera Arabic as a precondition for resuming normal relations. Even if that happens before the year end, the damage to the GCC may well be permanent, and it is possible that the organization will simply, in practice, wither away. In the Asia Pacific, China redoubled its efforts to promote its regional comprehensive economic partnership, RCEP, after America walked away from the TPP. As President Xi Jinping approached the late 2017 Chinese Communist Party Congress, his efforts to consolidate his position and announce China's powerful arrival on the global stage intensified. In spring 2017, the Belt and Road Summit brought together 29 heads of government and about 1,000 other participants to Beijing to promote Xi's signature geoeconomic project, which involves more than 60 countries. China is quickly developing high-tech weaponry and platforms that will, in time, make it a peer competitor to the United States and is extending its reach beyond its immediate region, most symbolically by opening on the 1st of August this year, a logistics base in Djibouti. Once his new term and Politburo are formalized, President Xi can be expected to insist more resolutely that the Chinese point of view on regional and international matters be more widely respected and even catered to. The states of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, are already alert to the strategic swagger demonstrated by a confident Chinese leadership and the approach, akin to the Monroe Doctrine, that it is taking to South China Sea issues. ASEAN celebrated its 50th anniversary in 2017, but its efforts to present a coordinated approach to regional security were hobbled by some of its members adopting a hedging strategy towards China. Any code of conduct ultimately agreed between China and ASEAN would probably not be robust enough to ensure uncontested and unfettered access to the international waters of the South China Sea and its features. Washington's engagement with the region will have to be resolute and consistent if the so-called principled approach to regional security it favors is to be maintained. North Korea was another challenger state that moved closer to securing its objectives over the past year, though it is difficult to ascribe this to US distraction. Pyongyang's nuclear and ballistic missile program was the one issue that consistently held the new US president's attention. 
Yet the efforts of the United States, Japan, South Korea, and China to constrain North Korean behavior failed. In 2017, North Korea's ballistic missile and nuclear tests accelerated in a breathtaking manner. North Korea very likely has the capacity to hit South Korea, Japan, and US forces in the region with a missile-delivered nuclear weapon. Its longer-range capabilities are in greater doubt. The two-stage Wasong-14 has a maximum range in excess of 7,500 kilometers and may be able to reach the US West Coast if armed with a warhead weighing 650 kilograms or less. A new design, one that also has the range to threaten the entire US mainland, could emerge in late 2017 or early 2018. In addition to launches associated with the development of an ICBM, Pyongyang will continue its efforts to create a submarine launch ballistic missile. The Pukyukon Song-1 has been test fired from a launch tube fixed to a submerged barge, but not from a deployable submarine. Future tests will feature launches from North Korea's one submarine. In the longer term, term Pyongyang will need to build at least two or three more submarines before it will have an operational sea-based missile force. In parallel, flight trials of the land-based version of the sub-launch missile will continue. Alongside the latest raft of Security Council sanctions, targeted measures might slow the pace of North Korea's progress. The fuel, a form of hydrazine, used by the Musadan, Wasong-12, and Wasong-14, is produced in only three countries, the US, Russia, and China. Cutting the supply or introducing contaminants to the fuel would seriously impede North Korea's missile program. So too would the introduction of computer viruses or other defects via electronics that North Korea imports. However, breaking the rhythm of North Korean activities will require concerted diplomatic effort by powers in and beyond Northeast Asia and a departure from the so far iterative efforts to implore change. North Korea will not agree to arms control measures to limit testing in the absence of a major US diplomatic initiative focused on Pyongyang, which does not appear likely. Ultimately, China and the US will need to cooperate more on a denuclearization strategy for the Korean Peninsula. The resources required to meet many of the rising challenges, whether in the sphere of nuclear non-proliferation, information warfare, terrorism, or the use of proxies, probably exist if they are correctly deployed. India, for instance, is concerned at the pace of China's military modernization and its due economic presence throughout Asia. It is, best, it is especially concerned by China-Pakistan's economic corridor, and it has a strong interest in upholding the rules-based order in the Indian Ocean region and beyond. And while India has long defined itself as a non-aligned power averse to defense collaboration with a Western state, a careful approach on the part of the US and other partners may be positively received. How India chooses to play a role in the defense and security architecture of Asia in 2018 and beyond will be crucial in determining whether there can be a regional concert or a balance of power in the region that does not rely uniquely on the nature of the US-China relationship. This is one example of a broader reality, that there is a limit to what ad hoc coalitions and state-to-state -state collaboration can achieve in the face of complex global threats. No state, of course, can be immune to external threats in today's networked world many of which can most effectively be tackled by collective action. The rebuilding, or in some cases, repurposing of alliances and institutions depends partly, of course, on political leadership. America seems for the moment to have laid down the baton, preferring a series of transactional and conditional arrangements. China is bending some states to its will, but its values do not inspire others to follow. A more collective approach, rather than one relying heavily on the leadership of an individual state, is perhaps the most likely route to the renewal of effective alliances and institutions, although group leadership is less easy to construct and practice than leadership by a single state. 
Yet here a problem arises that is not unique to the White House and the empty offices of the State Department and the Department of Defense. For many states in the Western camp are today caught in a strategic muddle. The tempo at which threats emerge and crises evolve, demanding a response, is stretching government capabilities and invites principally reactive approaches. Many Western states are preoccupied with domestic challenges that distract from considered strategy and sustained execution. It does not help that in a number of states, leaders make frequent adjustments in policy without reference to government colleagues, legislative branches, or the policy-making institutions that normally would produce considered options and measured outcomes. Of late, authoritarian states have been handing out lessons to the mature democracies in how to marshal and deploy the full range of state power to secure their strategic goals. They have also done a much better job of defining those goals. State and non-state actors that resent the status quo can nimbly disturb and infect the strategic landscape. Their appetite to take risks to change facts on the ground to their benefit has increased. It should surprise no one if this happens more often on numerous fronts at the same time. So geopolitical volatility is persistent and widespread, close to home and far away, and it requires the kind of close attention and careful analysis that the IISS has committed, of course, to providing through this strategic survey and by many other means uh, throughout the year. I'd now like to ask uh, a couple of my colleagues, four in fact, to just add a few points uh, in support of some of the general ideas uh, deployed in this year's strategic survey. Emil Hulkayem, first on the Middle East. Thank you, John. Uh, that was gloomy, but uh, I'm going to talk about the Middle East, so get ready. Um, as ISIS weakens and loses key territory uh, across Syria and Iraq, other fault lines in the Middle East, some old, some new, are becoming more active and more apparent uh, on the geopolitical landscape. There is an ongoing disruptive war uh, race for territory influence and dominance by local, regional, and international actors that is adding to the existing instability. These local and regional rivalries have been turbo boosted in recent times and are playing out uh, in, in pretty uh, concerning ways. Uh, for example, just now, Iraqi Kurds are about to vote on independence. The Iraqi Hashid, the Shia-dominated uh, uh, militias, uh, are moving towards all rich Kirkuk. Uh, Assad and his Russian and Iranian allies have crossed the Euphrates. Well, there was a US expectation that that wouldn't happen and have bombed uh, US, Kurdish, and, and Arab allies. In unnerved, Turkey is flexing muscle all along the border. But there is also another front uh, that is heating up, uh, the one between uh, Israel on one side and Iran and Hezbollah on the other. Hezbollah has grown in strength, reach, capability, and ambition in recent years. It has been hardened by its Syrian experience against Syrian rebels and against ISIS more recently. It feels vindicated in Lebanon and uh, in the region and thinks it has won, it says so actually. Uh, it has now better weaponry and more of it, uh, including rockets and rocket factories, as well as tougher fighters. Uh, as Hezbollah leaders Hassan Nasrallah just warned, uh, he can call upon thousands of fighters from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, uh, and other countries in case of a future conflict. Uh, transnational Shia militias today are a main driver of uh, uh, instability and conflict in the region. Israel has watched all that uh, and, and Syria unravel with, with great concern. Assad may have been an enemy, but he was weak and easy to deter. Today, Syria is filled with radical groups, and Iran and Hezbollah are on the ascent and developing military infrastructure, including very close to the Israeli and Jordanian borders. So Israel has to man a much longer border, a much more complex front line, and such a conflict, such a future conflict, may well involve Iran. Uh, given the array of forces present. So the structural condition for large-scale, very destructive conflict are, are met, are in place. The various actors don't necessarily want a war right away, um, but an accidental conflict uh, born out of you know, overconfidence, uh, miscalculation, misinterpretation may ignite it. The problem is that the US is pretty much absent from all these dynamics at this point. So all eyes are on Moscow to prevent such a war, and should it happen, contain, uh, try to contain it and, and de-escalate it. Thank you. Thank you. Nigel Einstein. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the um, 
issue of transnational terrorism and the way that is uh, mutating and uh, shaping um, the uh, international security landscape. Um, as uh, Emil has pointed out, uh, we're, we're seeing uh, the Islamic State foothold in um, Syria and uh, northern Iraq being uh, progressively eroded uh, to the point where its uh, long-time uh, sustainability is uh, seriously in question. But what this has not done um, has uh, it, um, produced a commensurate uh, reduction of Islamic State-inspired uh, activity around the world. Um, if anything, uh, the reverse. Uh, we're, we're, we're seeing um, arguably a, an increasing tempo. And it's a different kind of terrorism from what one might call um, terrorism, uh, jihadism 1.0, the Al-Qaeda model with its uh, focus on the far enemy, uh, very complex, centrally directed uh, plots uh, with uh, lots of command and control and lots of communication, making it relatively easy for intelligence services you know, to, 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 to get across these activities. And what we're now seeing, what might be termed jihadism 2.0, uh, is a much more distributed uh, form of uh, terrorist activity. If we look at uh, many of the events that have taken place in Europe in the last couple of years, uh, relatively few of these are so-called genuine lone wolves in, in that they're people acting entirely spontaneously without any direction. Often when one looks at these plots, it turns out that there is uh, quite a lot of uh, um, input uh, from Islamic State uh, central control, um, but um, a willingness to give operatives on the ground much greater leeway in determining how they actually undertake uh, the attacks uh, that uh, they do. Um, it remains to be seen how jihadism um, globally will mutate um, if and when, as seems likely, uh, the so-called caliphate um, is effectively uh, destroyed. But I think all the indications are that uh, the um, jihadist narrative, the jihadist ideology, if you like, um, will uh, persist, will evolve. And it has indeed shown a remarkable capacity to attach itself to a multiplicity of uh, different grievances an obvious case in point in the news at the moment being uh, the question of the Rohingya in uh, Myanmar. Um, it is certainly the case that there is uh, an organization, uh, the Iraq and Rohingya uh, Salvation Army, um, that has um, been um, receiving um, inputs from uh, jihadist organizations, has been training and uh, the proximate cause of uh, the uh, current exodus, expulsion of, of Rohingya was indeed attacks by the, this organization uh, against uh, the Myanmar uh, security authorities. Though, of course, the real cause you know, goes back uh, much further and has to do with uh, the uh, institutional discrimination that the Rohingya have suffered over uh, many, many decades. But I think this is a good example of how um, um, the, this ideology attaches itself to what has been essentially a local and uh, ethnic-based uh, uh, grievance and has uh, um, conflated it with uh, wider jihadist um, perspectives. Um, in all of this, I think we need to bear in mind that although much um, uh, time many column inches have been devoted to recent attacks in Europe. Relatively speaking, the numbers of uh, casualties, the amount of damage done by jihadists in Western Europe um, is, is very small compared with the um, very high levels of uh, sustained damage taking place in various parts of the uh, developing world in South Asia, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, East Africa, um, and uh, the Sahel. You know, this, this is you know, where the real damage is being done. This is where, again, the jihadist ideology is um, exacerbating and acting as a cons an accelerant for uh, destabilizing uh, local uh, grievances around the world. And I think we can expect this uh, trend to continue. Virginia Connolly. Sure. 
Well, I will say a few words that uh, further exemplify what Dr. Chipman was discussing in his uh, remarks about the de desirability for collective action. Well, over the next 12 months, we are likely to see the consolidation of a trend across sub-Saharan Africa, whereby international non-African initiatives, institutions, and intervention further lose their appeal, and I would also say sometimes credibility, in favor of local and sub-regional efforts. There are a number of factors feeding uh, this trend. First, I would say are the problems encountered by United Nations, mission, United Nations missions and the growing skepticism regarding UN effectiveness. Then there is also fear, quite widespread among African leaders, that the uh, US sees Sub-Saharan Africa as strategically insignificant, and also that European countries that have traditionally been close partners uh, to uh, African uh, leaders would eventually turn inwards in response to rising uh, domestic uh, nationalism and also rising uh, domestic discontent often as a result of the migration crisis. And a third factor has to do with the shrinking defense budget that we have been observing, especially over the past year, uh, with regard to key uh, African nations such as uh, South Africa and Nigeria that have traditionally uh, played a key uh, role in military interventions further afield within the continent, and that might not be in such a favorable position to continue in this uh, leading role. There have been a number of uh, recent examples that we have observed and documented in uh, this year's strategic survey that uh, really reinforce the idea that this trend is here and is here to stay. Uh, first was a, is a special uh, effort that is currently being undertaken by a group of five countries in the Sahel, the so-called Group of Five Sahel, that are currently creating uh, this uh, force to uh, counter terrorism and drug trafficking in the, uh, in the, in the region. A uh, second uh, effort, you might remember the political crisis in the Gambia when uh, President Yame uh, refused to leave office in spite of the fact that he had lost the election. Well, ECOWAS, the regional uh, West African bo uh, bloc, for the very first time in its history, threatened military uh, intervention in order to uphold uh, election results in a country that was not in a conflict. This was a very uh, risky uh, decision on the part of ECOWAS, but actually proved very effective and also showed that in spite of all the criticism that ECOWAS is often uh, receiving, it can act and it can act in a successful manner. And the, the, the third uh, example has to do with uh, judicial uh, institutions and African uh, tribunals. There seems to be the preference for African leaders, especially as the ICC is highly criticized and, and also seen by Africans as being biased against uh, African, African leaders. Uh, the, uh, this, for instance, was the case of the uh, appeal trial of former uh, Chadian President Habr at the uh, is, uh, extraordinary African chambers where his life sentence uh, was upheld, showing that these local uh, African judicial institutions are effective, further strengthening their credibility. So we expect that similar initiatives and interventions will, uh, will continue. Uh, but having said that, we, had, we don't expect foreign involvement to disappear uh, overnight. Uh, US, European, China, and other uh, international actors will continue to remain involved in the continent, and we document all of those uh, in, uh, in the book. But we are likely to see African uh, nations more firmly uh, in the driving seat. Thank you. Finally, Nick Redmond. Thank you. A few words about, about Russia. The country has, for much of the past year, uh, been in a, a holding pattern after previous years of landmark interventions, first in Ukraine and then in Syria. I think there are a few reasons for this, partly to see what the, the full implications of those interventions would be, partly uh, to see whether a new US administration of a very different stripe might fundamentally reset relations, and also to focus more on domestic affairs, as Russia has a presidential election coming at the start of next year. I don't expect Russia to fully emerge from this holding pattern until the election is over, although we've already seen the first sign of that in July with the decision to expel 755 US diplomats from the embassy in Moscow. Uh, evidently, uh, if I can apologize to Samuel Beckett, Russia is no longer waiting for Donald. So what then? Uh, what do I see is on the radar? I think a watching brief on Ukraine, uh, looking for opportunities, but also very alert to threats 
uh, if they are perceived. Extreme vigilance, I think, also on other fraternal partners, including Belarus, which is currently uh, hosting ZAPAD exercises. I think there's a need for Russia to sit down with China. Russia feels this need to sit down with China to talk about how the Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia is going to mesh with Russia's plans for the Eurasian Economic Union. And then at the top of the pile, the question is the strategic balance with the United States. The problem that has developed in the last 10 to 15 years is an asymmetry of capability, because while the US has invested heavily in missile defense and conventional weapons of strategic quality, Russia has not. Now, this asymmetry, asymmetry of capability has led to an asymmetry of focus for negotiations. So while the United States wishes to sit down and talk about nuclear weapons, Russia wants a much broader discussion. And so far, uh, we have not made any progress from those positions. How to deal with Russia more generally is a question of considerable debate. Uh, I would suggest to you it's better to, uh, it's easier to see Russia in this terms. It's a body politic that currently displays symptoms of narcissistic paranoia. It fears that Western states seek to subordinate Russia, topple its government, and seize its resources. And although this fear is instrumentalized in its domestic politics, it is nevertheless at its core genuinely held. And also, Russia believes that political upheaval even far beyond its borders, are practice runs and preparatory steps with the ultimate objective of securing change in Russia. This includes not only Georgia's Rose Revolution and Ukraine's Orange Revolution, but also the Arab Spring, where the West, in Russian perception, practice hybrid warfare, including the use of proxies and its own tech companies to change governments which were not of its liking. The latest US sanctions on Russia, it's worth noting, were described by the heretofore moderate Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev as full-scale economic war declared on Russia. So for Western states, I suggest tentatively the place to start would be to explore whether there are ways to calm Russia's fears about external intervention and its own domestic security. Targeted sanctions against Putin's nearest and dearest might be a good place to start. This will involve negotiation. Treating negotiations as a reward that should be withheld is to my mind wrong. Negotiations are a way for each side to discover more about the other's perceptions and to see where there might be areas for common interest and understanding. They need not be a prelude to surrender. Thanks very much. Well, very happy to open up a, a conversation over the next half an hour, questions on the book or uh, issues that uh, it will have uh, covered. And we have colleagues also here in the front row who can take any of the questions those of us here on the stage feel we can't. Any, anyone want to start? Yes. Just if you could wait just five seconds for a microphone to come. I have a question for Nigel. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a researcher at the ICSR and a postgraduate student at King's College London. Given the territorial losses you're explaining with regards to the, the Islamic State, can you shed some light on the way that Al Qaeda are presenting and positioning themselves um, and what, what we should really expect from them in the next three to five years? Uh, we're seeing, uh, interestingly, in Syria, uh, what purports to be an umbrella organization, uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, um, um, which recently um, um, executed um, more or less total occupation of Idlib uh, province, um, you know, really, I, I think, you know, uh, can be seen as um, operational, uh, an operational arm of Al-Qaeda uh, waiting in the wings. And, and uh, it's interesting to see that uh, um, as, as they've uh, moved into Idlib, uh, some of their you know, um, old practices uh, are starting to uh, reassert themselves. If we look at Al-Qaeda as an organization, um, I think what, what, what seems to have been happening is uh, a strategy of waiting Islamic State out, waiting to see Islamic State uh, crash and burn, and then seeking to take advantage of uh, the uh, vacuum uh, that they hope would, would be left behind. The, the, the leadership of uh, Al-Qaeda, Iman Zawahiri, seems to be uh, fairly uh, safely ensconced uh, somewhere in uh, Pakistan. Uh, I won't say more than that at the moment. Uh, we've also got um, uh, in Yemen uh, a, a significant arm of Al Qaeda engaged uh, in extensive uh, military uh, operations. Um, and we've also got um, 
quite a number of Al-Qaeda affiliates uh, strung out still um, around um, um, the parts of Africa that are, are most uh, afflicted by jihadist-related conflict. So if you add up all the, the, the totality of Al-Qaeda's global capabilities, potentially they still do amount uh, to, to, to quite, uh, quite a bit. And the question is um, whether and at what point Al-Qaeda is capable of reasserting itself as the kind of uh, leadership of uh, global jihad and how it might go about this. It's not a foregone conclusion that this will happen. It may well be the case that Al-Qaeda does you know, remain become, does remain on the sidelines, and we see something else, something probably more extreme and more brutal um, even than Islamic State has shown itself to be, uh, emerged to take the place of, of Islamic State. Not that Islamic State um, as a concept is about to disappear overnight. So it's difficult to know for sure um, how um, Al-Qaeda is going to uh, play itself uh, back into the game or, 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 or whether indeed it will. But uh, the potential is, is clearly there. Desmond Bowen. Um, Five seconds. There you go. Doesn't buy a double less member. Um, I think it's probably for Nick, and it's um, about the association of Russia and China. Um, I mean, the most striking sort of <coughs> physical uh, demonstration of some kind of you know, greater connection is, is exercising together, not least in the Baltic um, area and in the Mediterranean. I mean, is this kind of superficial? Um, shared interest, or is there something deeper in terms of the future of Russia, China, Chinese, um, the potential of coordination? Uh, let me give you a third answer. It's real but limited. Um, uh, real in the sense that there is a commonality of view um, about how the world should be ordered. Um, and knocking the United States off its pedestal of, of predominance um, and giving those other powers uh, a greater share. To some extent, great country exceptionalism from the rules of international order that should otherwise be uh, strenuously observed. Uh, I think the ardor is probably greater on the Russian side, um, and Russia has uh, a dilemma in how it shapes its relationship with China to avoid getting cast into the role of a, of a junior partner. But uh, I think there's still a fair measure of, of distrust. And um, it's interesting that in Central Asia, as I say, thus far, they've managed to reach an accommodation that few people were expecting. But nevertheless, as I, as I indicated in the, the comments, Belt and Roads presents a new challenge for Russia. And it's one where it's not clear that China is going to be willing to listen quite as, as intently as, as Russia might like. Nigel, would you like to add? Um, yeah, um, what we've got is as a situation of, of uh, accommodation, it's not something that uh, looks likely to, tr um, to um, emerge as an alliance relationship, even though there, there are uh, prominent uh, scholars in China, people like Yan Xuetong, who are arguing that China should forge a full-blown uh, alliance uh, with Russia. Um, at the moment, the, we've got a modus vivendi in which effectively Russia is recognized as the junior partner, but China is uh, sufficiently circumspect uh, not to rub uh, Russia's nose in this fact. But I think the reality is that China ha has taken the view that Russia remains essentially rooted in Europe and is a fundamentally European country, and that uh, its um, turn to the east uh, is uh, a tactic uh, driven uh, of necessity rather than something that uh, uh, represents uh, a genuine conviction or a, a strategic uh, turning point. Uh, so to that uh, extent, I think China uh, will continue to, to view the relationship with Russia in, in, in a fairly uh, instrumental and uh, tactical way. General Village, yeah. there you go. Charles Vivian, a member of the Institute. May I ask a question perhaps to Emil? Uh, on the assumption that the uh, caliphate is dismantled during the next six months or a year, at least territorially, how do you see 
the structure, political structure and other structures in Syria after its disappearance. And what you see in terms of a confrontation between America and Russia as a consequence. Um, what's shaping up is, uh, it's, it's a trend for the past few years, it's, it's a soft partition of Syria. Uh, where you have specific zones of influence for regional and international actors. We can go around the map and describe them. Um, and, um, and, and, but right now, the race is really for what is left of the caliphate. Uh, so the, the, the eastern push in Syria uh, is largely motivated, for instance, by the fact that ISIS used to control uh, pretty all rich but also uh, you know uh, um, farm rich uh, areas uh, in in and around the resort so this is what one of the reasons why you see that race uh, to, to the to the east so the all the parties are busy securing as much as they can of that territory in the expectation that there will be a russia centered uh, 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 negotiation uh, about those various zones um, the it's still, um, there's still a measure of power play in, in all that. I mean, uh, the US, for instance, had expected uh, the Russians to uh, um, you know, prevent the crossing of forces, uh, of, uh, of asset forces of the Euphrates. Or uh, Israel, Jordan, and the US had expected Russia to prevent the deployment of uh, Iranian Hezbollahis, etc., in, in southern Syria, too close to the border. And this hasn't really happened. It just show you, it shows you that there is still a lot of flux uh, and that the advantage, the momentum, is still on the Assad, Russian, Iranian side. Now, the question is, how do you formalize all that and whether this will happen? Um, the Geneva process is, is moribund. It exists uh, because Europeans, others want to maintain the perception, uh, and the Americans want to maintain the perception of process because they told us forever that there was no military solution in Syria. Well, there was one. It happened on the ground. And the real negotiation is happening elsewhere, in Astana, other places. Uh, Geneva is there for, for the show. So it's difficult to see how this is going to be formalized, how you know, major powers are going to agree to all that. They may not have to agree. They may just have to agree to the reality that is in, in front of them. So Assad will survive uh, in a weaker form, but he will still be in place. Um, but what you see is a Syria that is largely, uh, that is weak and coherent with the emergence of loss of militias, rivalries within the, within the regime among those militias, and tensions between all these actors, Russia, Iran, Turkey, etc. So I, I don't think we should look at this as uh, some kind of stable uh, uh, situation. And just in the back there, uh, you, and then we've got two in the front. <laughs> yeah, one, two. Yeah. My name is Kamir Behrang uh, from Iran International TV. I just want to add another angle to the previous question that we have many evidence that Iranian and Hezbollah trying to moving Shia to a specific area in Syria. Do you see that a divided or federal Syria after Daesh? Uh, or, or, or um, so uh, th this is true. I mean, you know, there's, uh, there, ha there is a degree of uh, uh, demographic, sectarian, uh, ethnic engineering going on uh, in Damascus and Hamas, uh, along the Lebanese-Syrian border, in the south, etc. Uh, so this is happening, but I don't think it's happening uh, with the, uh, the expectation that there will be a federation. I think Assad, uh, uh, the Iranians, the Russians are, push, are pushing hard against this idea of, uh, of a federation. <laughs> Uh, this is not, it's not their self-image. They want to rebuild a strong centralized state. It may not be possible, at least in the case, uh, in the case of Assad. But uh, a federal state would mean, you know, rethinking the constitution, having, the, you know, the input and the approval of, of a bit everyone, including the Kurds. I, I don't think that that process exists at this point. Uh, so that's, I, I would still think that uh, the outcome of all these dynamics is a soft partition where people accept the reality on the ground. There is a degree of trade, uh, people can travel around, etc. cetera, but uh, it is not uh, embedded in, in laws and the Constitution. And in the front row, two first, Stuart first, yeah. And then. Thank you, Stuart Brooks, Chevron. Um, 
John, a couple of questions about North Korea, mm. breathtaking development. <laughs> Has North Korea done all this on its own, or is there some sort of shadowy AQ Khan figure who's helping them? And then the wider proliferation aspects, the risk of Japan, South Korea deciding to retaliate in kind. And is there any evidence that North Korea might be thinking or doing of proliferation outwards? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask uh, Matt Cotty to answer the last two and a half questions. I might just kick off on, on external um, uh, aid. Um, IISS uh, senior fellow for um, ballistic missiles expert Michael Ellerman uh, wrote uh, about six or eight weeks ago for us uh, assessing that the uh, RD-250 uh, engine uh, that had been used on the Wasong missile probably came from a factory in the Ukraine, uh, that factory being situated in an area contiguous to where uh, there was a great deal of instability in Ukraine. Uh, we were quick to add that we didn't judge or assess that the Ukrainian government uh, was in any sense complicit in this. And indeed, in 2012, the Ukrainian government did arrest a couple of North Koreans who were poking around in Ukraine. So the North Koreans had form, as it were, in seeking uh, um, uh, technology from outside that it couldn't indigenously, indigenously produce uh, uh, from the inside. So there is still a, a role for, as it were, the international community to make certain uh, that the supply chains for uh, uh, equipment and technology that are relevant to North Korea's program are tightened up uh, as much as possible. But Matt, can you take off from there? and? provide a bit more. Uh, certainly, I'll stand so you can, you can see me. Um, I think, uh, building on, on John's point, I think there is uh, certainly suspicions that North Korea has not done everything on its own. Um, Ukraine, Russia have been mentioned. There's also the case of Iran. Iran has already been sanctioned by the US for its involvement in a specific 80-ton uh, thrust development for a, for a motor. Um, but I think it's, it's dangerous to underestimate North Korea's domestic capabilities as well. It's managed to develop a uh, very high level of indigenous capability, um, both in terms of uh, chemical industry, uh, the, the construction of, of engines itself. So I think it's, it's certainly likely to have had outside assistance, but it's dangerous to underestimate that it, that it hasn't developed some capability as well. And we've seen reports of a number of North Korean students studying in China, for example, at universities on very specific, um, highly technical degree courses. I think in terms of the risk of proliferation, um, it's certainly a very uh, high concern. I think more strongly linked to, to missile technology rather than nuclear specific. Um, and I think um, there is certainly greater concern now, given the heightened discussion of, of military options, of the, th of the threat of loose nukes, should there be any kind of regime collapse or warring factions left within North Korea after any kind of military conflict. And that is something that, that China is very concerned about, in addition to the US and South Korea, who would go in and presumably uh, secure these facilities uh, and, and weapons. Um, and with regard to the risk of proliferation within the region, it's certainly gaining more attention, um, both because of North Korean provocations, but I think also because of a fear of, of US alliances and the weakening, uh, potential weakening uh, messaging that, that, that the Trump administration is sending to the region. I still don't think it's at the point that uh, we need to fear yet, um, but it's certainly a, a growing narrative within, particularly within uh, Republic of Korea, but also also Japan. Uh, thank you, uh, Gordon Barris, a member of the Institute. <clears throat> so in Beijing soon, Xi Jinping will get up and say we're on the rise. How do you see China's capabilities, particularly in the military sphere, changing over the next few years? Mm. What is going to be the main characteristics of that, those developments? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I might just start with Ben Barry, actually, right? Uh, can you come back up here? Thank you. <laughs> uh, obviously, we, uh, we do a lot of this in the military balance uh, and the military balance plus, but Ben, go ahead. Well, I think you're going to see quite a bit of modernization Earlier this year in the military balance, we covered at some length the rearrangement of their strategic command and control 
on a very US model and also the work that's going on to modernize the management of their defense industry. Uh, we've also chronicled um, really some quite interesting modernization of their aerospace, where in some areas they're actually posing formidable challenge to Western, Western air forces. And I think Nick Charles is best placed to talk about the naval challenge. Thanks, Ben. Um, on, the, on the naval front, um, I think what we've seen uh, in the last couple of years and we're seeing uh, uh, developing even further now is a maturing of the capabilities, a huge amount of investment, uh, which is continuing which is creating mature capabilities, uh, allowing uh, China in, in, in naval terms to present a, a really credible challenge to US uh, naval forces in the Western Pacific. But it is also uh, developing its uh, broader power projection capabilities. It has a very nascent uh, carrier capabilities, but it is <coughs> investing hugely in those. They do need significant investments and it's still a, it's still a long journey, but that is a, a, a significant uh, uh, capability that is continuing to, to be developed. And we are seeing that being expressed now in the greater uh, long-range deployment of Chinese naval forces into the Indian Ocean. Uh, John mentioned uh, the, the establishment of the, the, the base in Djibouti. That is again maturing uh, and, and, and will continue uh, to do so, albeit that uh, certainly in terms of uh, power projection capabilities, it's still got a long way to go to uh, in any way uh, replicate the kind of capabilities that the US Navy has. And two James. more, James Hackett and James. then Nigel. James? Just on a, a, a sort of briefly technical issue before uh, I hand over to Nigel. I mean, one of the interesting things more broadly across Chinese military modernization is how they're starting to leverage the technological developments within society and start to apply some of those lessons to the military capabilities they're starting to field. Um, we've got a piece coming in a, in a new military balance, which will talk about air-to-air -air weapons technology, and we sort of highlighted some of those developments in the military balance uh, earlier in the year. For instance, the sort of beginnings of integration of active e-scan radar technology on some dogfighting air-to-air weapons, and putting China in the capability league of only a handful of other nations worldwide. So it's a broad uh, state aspiration to modernize society, and that's feeding through into the military arm of state power as well. And we'll start to see some of those other radar developments, let's say, feeding through into the maritime domain as well. Um, and that, of course, then marries into uh, the organizational developments that Ben highlighted. Where, of course, then we have to see further progress before China really matures as a military power is in operationalizing these capabilities. And what do you use to having the carrier if you can't integrate and operate a carrier strike group? Or, or maintain integration with air and uh, long-range surveillance assets. So it's in the, in the sort of proof is in the pudding, really, rather than just in fielding military capabilities. But certainly China is on the path to uh, greater military power. Nigel? Yeah, if you look at uh, what Xi Jinping said in his speech uh, commemorating the 90th uh, anniversary of the founding of the PLA, you, you see uh, a number of key issues um, which, which are going to uh, drive uh, Chinese military modernization. Firstly, there, there is a question of uh, party loyalty, you know, the, the reminder that the, the PLA is basically the armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, you're going back to the days of the Gutian Conference in the 1920s. Um, then there's the associated question of um, corruption or dealing with corruption in the ranks of the military, which has been a significant uh, concern for Xi Jinping. Then you know, there, there, there are more technical questions of um, developing uh, fighting capabilities and an emphasis on um, military exercises that, that really do simulate conflict situations rather than in the past, you know, looking rather more like uh, propaganda uh, films. Um, and um, and you know, um, obviously uh, force integration, we've seen a very significant uh, uh, reorganization within the Chinese military organizationally away from a focus on a land-based army towards uh, more uh, integrated military operations which are uh, you know, navy and uh, air-led. Um, and in particular, a focus on uh, high technology. And there are certain areas where the, China, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the term of art that Xi, Jing Xi Jinping used was uh, you know, um, military civil integration, uh, Jinping Rongha. 
um, and um, a particular focus on certain kinds of high technology, notably artificial intelligence, uh, quantum computing, quantum encryption, uh, uh, in artificial intelligence, I think the Chinese have realized that they do have a significant advantage uh, because there are two things that determine how artificial intelligence evolves. One is computing power, which is now a given. The other is data, and the Chinese have just got a whole lot more than anybody else. And uh, in quantum encryption, if they do succeed in their very ambitious plans to develop operational quantum encryption, and there is a big if there, it may not be possible you know, there, there, there may be physical realities that they cannot overcome, but they are throwing a, a whole lot of resources at it. And if they do succeed, this becomes a game changer. Everybody's saying that. So Virginia. Yes, well, we do talk about China's involvement in sub-Saharan Africa in the book. And I think what is interesting to note is that even though we normally see uh, China as a country that is very reluctant to intervene militarily in any other country, and in fact its prime interest within the sub-Saharan African region is to do with uh, minerals infrastructure uh, projects and so on and so forth. You know, by the end of 2016, China had contributed more personnel to peacekeeping operations than any other of the permanent members of the Security Council. Of course, the numbers are far below. You know, countries such as Pakistan or you know, those traditional who traditionally have uh, supplied lots of uh, personnel. But that's very, uh, I think that's a very interesting thing to note. And most of those peacekeepers tend to be uh, in, in Africa and tend to be in places such as South Sudan and Mali, where China has also has lost some of its uh, peacekeepers. The, the military base in Djibouti has already been mentioned, but there are also reports that other Chinese bases within Africa may actually pop up in the coming years. So I think that's also an interesting change that needs to be noted here. Thanks very much. Uh, oops, yeah. Gentleman right there, yes, with the hand up. And we have one more in the front, and I think I'd, after that we might close. But uh, Roly Sword from SC Strategy. Emil, there's probably a few. Um, I was going to ask you about Saudi Arabia. We're likely to see a new king in the next year, um, and Mohammed bin Salman has somewhat sold himself on this economic and reform package. If he does become king, I was wondering what you think will happen both within the regional politics but also domestically, bearing in mind the social reform is likely to challenge sort of the authority even more of the religious establishment and they may not necessarily be willing to accept that. Uh, certainly. I mean, uh, the rise of uh, Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman has been quite stunning and his ability co to consolidate uh, power in a country that uh, most... Uh, Saudi and Middle East experts agreed was uh, organized precisely to avoid concentration of power is, is, quite, uh, is quite something. Um, now, he's, he's really in charge of everything at this point. Uh, defense policy uh, sits on the Supreme Petroleum Council, uh, economic reform, etc. So quite a huge portfolio. Um, but uh, I think um, it, all, these, all these tracks uh, are going to face and already facing uh, challenges. I mean, there are already revisions to the very ambitious economic reform program that they put forward. Um, there is criticism uh, inside, still a bit muted, but in terms of uh, uh, either Yemen or Qatar and other issues. Uh, Saudi Arabia is expending a lot of effort, a lot of uh, energies and resources uh, regionally, uh, and the returns are not clear yet uh, on this front. So if and when uh, Mohammed bin Salman becomes, becomes king, uh, he's going to have, have his hands uh, uh, full. We already see some of those tensions playing out. So there is an opening of the social space uh, with you know, a much more positive messaging towards entrepreneurs, uh, private sector, etc. But there's also a closing of the political space in parallel. And in the past couple of weeks have, have shown that. Uh, you know, more people uh, jailed, uh, you know, dissent being uh, uh, harshly uh, uh, attacked, etc. cetera. Um, the problem, I mean, it's, it's really about re-engineering a very complex society uh, and, and uh, a, a society that has come to expect benefits from the state, uh, a state that didn't really think in terms of, of spending and so on. So, uh, you know, Fighting in a couple of uh, countries, having a very ambitious foreign policy, trying to revamp society, all at the same time, while oil prices are you know, uh, quite stagnant, certainly not at the level that Saudi requires, uh, is, uh, I mean, that's a, a combination of, of, of massive uh, challenges. Uh, I still have to say that internally, there is a sense that 
uh, at least there is some dynamism. And, you know, Saudi Arabia for a very long time was this very stagnant place where uh, uh, ambitious uh, decisions weren't necessarily made. It was, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, old princes trying to manage the status quo. So at least there is this sense of drive. Uh, but that can actually create a lot of frists also inside society that can be very damaging and devastating. Um, we'll see. I mean, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in his place. Last question. <laughs> Hello. Oh, sorry, one more, two more, not away. Yeah. Uh, Brunello Rosa, City University, a member of the Institute. A couple of questions, if I may. One for uh, Virginia. I wanted to, um, to know what, what she thinks um, uh, the importance is of uh, the growing uh, uh, development of urbanization as a a geopolitical uh, um, development, not just uh, therefore uh, geopolitical developments at national level, but at urban level also in terms of threat, given the recent trend of, uh, of urbanization. The other thing is, how do you think, whoever is uh, willing to answer that in, uh, in the panel, is going to be the impact of geopolitical developments on uh, economic and financial markets variables, considering that uh, Geopolitics has re recently entered uh, the reaction function of uh, central banks, uh, the Fed and uh, the ECB being primary examples, I would say. Got it. Uh, before Virginia, perhaps we'll have you and then we'll take it all together. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Julian Egan from International Alert. Um, half Syria, half multilateral institutions question. Um, in post-conflict environments, we see a very familiar machinery kicking into uh, gear. Um, you know, World Bank, IMF, governance, basic services, support. Um, in the day after that you've described uh, a fragmented Syria, uh, some of which is actually, you know, the status quo, the, the Assad regime, what does that mean for the role of these international institutions, um, given the, the, you know, who wields power uh, in their boards at the moment? Thanks. So we'll start with Virginia on uh, urbanization, then uh, Emil on Syria, and maybe uh, Nick Redman, who just returned from a major Jew economics uh, conference we ran in the Middle East, can say a few words on how we look at the link between geopolitics and, and finance. Yeah. Well, urbanization. This year's uh, book actually has a special essay on urbanization, violence, and city led policy making, which you might want to uh, take a look at. And actually, the issue of urbanization, especially in developing regions, is what and my program and the security and development program is uh, focusing on at the moment and for the, uh, for the coming years. Uh, we acknowledge the importance, uh, the strategic importance of larger mega cities in developing countries, both as a driving force economically for, the, for their entire countries, but also as a source potentially of uh, instability. We see the proliferation of uh, no-go areas or areas where the state has limited uh, presence within some of the key uh, mega cities in the world, in places such as Rio de Janeiro, Karachi, Cape Town, Lagos, and, and, and many others. Uh, so we see the emergence of parallel uh, economic systems, parallel systems of governance, uh, which certainly are a, uh, are a concern. W one important message that we try to put across in our essay is that. Well, two, two things. One, that we shouldn't equate the proliferation of these larger megacities to, uh, exclusively to threats and insecurity. They are also a source of opportunity, and we should make that very clear. We should not look at everything through the prism of threats. Uh, uh, the other thing is, that is the importance of city-led policy making. We have, no, we have seen how mayors of important cities have a key role to play in order to better understand the challenges faced by those cities and also uh, implement more effective institutions. So what we are arguing here is uh, national level uh, policy makers being complemented by local level uh, institutions and initiatives. Emil. Uh, sure. The the, the issue of the reconstruction of Syria is uh, certainly one of the most complex uh, dilemmas uh, that a uh, uh, you know, variety of countries are facing right now. Uh, because there hasn't been a political transition. And yesterday or two days ago, at the UN countries that uh, support, uh, at least ostensibly, uh, 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 the notion of political transition said no funding unless um, you know, there is uh, a, a negotiated political settlement. 
uh, there won't be one anytime soon. So that basically means that they're they're out of that uh, that equation. The the dilemma is, is the following: is uh, the the argument for uh, humanitarian assistance and reconstruction is that uh, this is the largest humanitarian disaster in the Middle East that has caused a massive refugee wave. Uh, the level of misery is unbelievable. Um, you know, there is a special responsibility, etc. So something needs to be done. You accept the reality and you try to deal with that. Uh, the counter argument is to say, um, uh, we're not the cause of that. Uh, you know, the Russians and the Iranians, since they won, let them own it. Um, we're not going to subsidize a, a regime that has caused such destruction and, 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 uh, and the misery. Uh, we're not going to subsidize uh, the regime's stabilization and counterinsurgency campaign by putting in money. So there is no clear model here for how to you know, reconcile uh, those, those, those two arguments. Um, I mean, and, but other countries, I mean, like uh, China, India, etc., are saying, okay, if that's the case, we'll do it uh, unilaterally. I mean, deal directly with uh, uh, with the Syrian government, provide all this. So, you know, it's still a very confusing uh, space. Now, international organization. Th the problem today is that Syria is is, is addressed in sometimes uh, non-political terms. It's a conflict that needs to be addressed. Now, major governments don't necessarily want to jump into this. So international, ironically, international organizations may have a greater role because you leave it to the bureaucrats. You leave it to the World Bank you do it for, to, to figure out uh, ways. And you, you take out the politics out of that. So you're not necessarily responsible for all this. I'm not saying a decision has been made, but these are the, the very strengths. It's a very, very confusing environment. And to be honest, Ultimately, when you look at the level of human misery, I mean, you know, whether refugees or IDPs, and uh, I think it's 30, something like 30% of the housing in Syria that's been obliterated, I'm not even going to look at other services, etc. Uh, the immediate humanitarian argument is, is very compelling. But there are second and third uh, 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 order effects that, uh, um, that you have to consider as well. Uh, and that's where uh, the, um, you know, the, the concerns uh, emerge. Nick Redman. Yeah, a big question, a <laughs> brief answer. Um, um, uh, so the process of, of geopolitics um, infecting, or touching on the commercial and financial realms is something that's already quite an advanced um, process. It's what the irony is that the United States, which has consistently been uh, on the most uh, leading advocates for free trade and free commerce, uh, has also, in the form of its Congress, been uh, very willing to politicize certain relationships, commercial relationships, for, for political ends. Um, and, and the advent, particularly, of financial sanctions in this regard, which, which uh, has changed policymaker perceptions of the, of the eff efficacy and the punch uh, that sanctions can impose in a way that really we haven't seen, arguably, since, since the days of gunbow diplomacy. Um, so I think it's easy to see some of these things, particularly uh, questions of currency with China's plan for uh, the renminbi to come probably an international currency, Russia's uh, desire to set up its own payment system, increasing use of the Hong Kong dollar to avoid the US dollar. These are all signs of uh, economic instruments are in some sense being regarded as tools in the struggle. And as the struggle becomes more intense, which is what we're tracking throughout this strategic survey, I think it's reasonable to assume that these incursions into commercial and financial realms are only likely to increase. Many thanks. So as you see, we very much enjoyed this uh, conversation with the IISS uh, membership and others on the basis of the 2017 uh, strategic survey, which we think is a, a great book. I hope that you agree. It's worth dipping into and even perhaps uh, reading from uh, front to back. Thank you very much for uh, joining us this uh, morning, and we look forward to continuing uh, the conversation in other formats. Thank you. Thank you.